everybody. And well, let me start with a word of prayer as we begin. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your work that you do all around the world. And especially today, we want to think about what you're doing in Taiwan. Thank you for Calvary supporting us in Taiwan. And pray that you would encourage our faith and let us see your work in other people's lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So I have titled this Hidden Fruit and taking off on the sermon that um, Jesus has chosen us to bear fruit, to be an influence. But sometimes that fruit is hidden. We can't see it at first. And it doesn't look the way we want. But we got to trust God for doing his work and just to stay in Jesus. And he'll, let, he'll take care of that. So hidden fruit, spreading faith in Jesus among Chinese. And my name is Stephen Oliver. Um, you'll see a picture of my family in a minute. But um, I've been in Taiwan for 15 years at China Lutheran Seminary. And Calvary has been supporting me there, has been supporting us. This is my family. Um, you see the Olivers, that's me. And Jeannie, um, her name is Virginia, from my mother, named after my mother, Virginia, but we call her Jeannie. And Gary, Isaac, and Maggie, my wife. And it snowed in China Lutheran Seminary this year, on January 24th. Um, you can see the children. Here's our seminary here. And there's Gary and Jeannie and Isaac and Nathan. And they're, they're <coughs> they hooked up to catch snow on their tongue. But this is very rare. We've never seen it snow in Taiwan. Like that, way up on the really tall mountains it snows, but usually not in most of the place. Where's the snow? Here. <laughs> That's on my glove. A snow plate. Right there. And there are some snowflakes. <laughs> Real snowflakes, but they just melted immediately. So it was kind of interesting. Um, so pray, pray for Taiwan. Pray for us. Because it's a um, very small percentage of Christians. Maybe five are at the most 10%. 5% Christian probably. And um, so we, we live up here. It's Taipei right to the north, right about there. And we live right here. It's an hour drive south of Taipei. So right where we live is right there, about a quarter down from the top, right on the ocean next to China, on the Taiwan Strait. So that's where we live. And um, here, this is a video. Can you press the... Oh, press that, yeah. Press the cursor. There. So this is a video of our fellowship group planning. And see Maggie there, and all these people are part, um, the wives were all part of a fellowship in our home that um, Maggie helps lead. Um, it's the mommy's group. And then it's a larger group of the husbands. We all got together and we're planning how to have different fellowship groups to reach out. For example, in this home here, um, this couple, they decided to branch off and have a fellowship group in their home in a big apartment to reach out to other new believers. And so that's what the mommy group does too and the various different fellowship groups. And here's all the children from the group sitting there watching a video. <laughs> and Chinese New Year, um, we use a traditional thing that Chinese like is to put a blessing up on their door in words. And it's usually a traditional Chinese blessing. But we use um, the gospel and scripture thoughts to make them coincide with kind of a poetic way of writing them and putting on doors. And this is our door. This is where we live. You see Isaac and Jimmy there. And we have a gospel message there and about God's word lasting forever. And this is um, and my father-in-law's door. Remember I mentioned that Jeannie was the only, I mean, Maggie was the only Christian among 50, her 50 Taiwan relatives. And if you can imagine that, that's a real culture shock. And she became a Christian coming to America to study for one year and then was baptized here and then went back and went to church there. And so we put these in my father-in-law's door and that was a witness to them and blessing to, to see the words, you know. And um, here are my in-laws, my father-in-law and my mother-in-law and my brother-in-law. And during the Chinese New Year when we're 
having dinner at their house. Here's another, my, my mother-in-law's side, her brothers and sisters. And um, the story can be told about each of them. Her sister is a fortune teller. And she got into fortune telling because some unfortunate things happened to her. Um, she had a brother, this brother, which is um, handicapped. And um, so trying to figure out why are people born that way. And then also her husband um, sort of, in a way, just left her, didn't support her. So trying to understand these things, so she went into Chinese fortune telling to try to realize the cause for this. And um, so there's a lot that we can say about that, but we're really witnessing the gospel. My mother-in-law is still pretty resistant to the gospel, but her husband was recently baptized. So I'll share a little bit more about that later. So we pray. We pray for these relatives. If you think of it, you can pray. You can pray for these. A lot of 50 people. And see, there's a whole group of them. That's only one side. That's about 25 on the mother's side. There's another whole, about that many on the father's side as well. And I'm keeping a prayer list to write each of their names and put their pictures so I can, we can individually pray. Um, with the faith that they will all become Christian. <laughs> you can pray with great boldness and faith. And here's the father's side, but this is only part of them. This is only part of them on my father-in-law's side at Chinese New Year. And this is my parents' home. And the reason I put this up is you see the children go there to play. Here's the TV. This is the living room. And right in the TV and living room is the uh, place of worship, traditional worship of the ancestor tablet. Um, this is what it looks like up close. It's in a really kind of little ornate box, and it's a tablet that's only about this big, about as big as this bulletin, the tablet. Is this Andrew's? This yours? It's a, it's a tablet about this size, and um, it, um, the, it's got the name, the family name on it, and then recorded on the back. It's got um, names of individual relatives. But it's a very important part of the Chinese spirituality. And my father-in-law, being the oldest of six sons, he's the caretaker of that. And every year they have worship. I've actually been there when they've done the worship with incense. My mother-in-law said to me, Oh, you, we know that, Stephen, you're a Christian. You don't worship the ancestors, but when it comes your turn, you can pray and so I prayed and silently. And then after we finished all of that, they asked me, what did you pray? And I said, well, I prayed to thank God for our ancestors and our parents because God gave us birth through them and he nourishes us. And I also prayed that we would follow their good examples. And um, that's, we Christians believe in following the good examples of our ancestors and thanking God for them. So, um, they said, oh, yeah, that's amazing. So Christians really respect their ancestors, too. And I would just convey, yeah, we don't worship them because God is the only one that can help us. But, um, but we do thank God for them and want to follow their good examples. Um, you know, every Sunday when we talk about Abraham and Paul and all, we're talking about our spiritual ancestors, right, mm -hmm. and their faith example. So um, this is still in my parents in laws home, even though my father's bap my father in law is baptized, and this was one stumbling block to him being baptized. What should we do about the ancestors? But the pastor who baptized him had also become a Christian at a as an adult. And he became a pastor. And he he was really rooted in the whole culture. And so he said, Yeah, we we can still honor the ancestors but not worship them. And there's a lot we can do to remember them every year and so forth. So um, I don't know what we'll do about this, but um, we'll have to wait and see what God God has in plan. Okay, so you can see they, they burn incense to worship and they have the candles and they even put food out on a little table that they feel somehow the ancestors can receive. Here is at the tomb, there's my mother-in-law, and at the tomb they also have ancestor worship and honoring. But interestingly enough, my wife and I, we went this time, they have a tomb weeping and cleaning time, and they use that to worship the ancestors, and they 
bring a lot of things, flowers and food, all kinds of food to the, and drink to give to the ancestors. And um, they even burn paper money that's fake money. And I've wondered, why don't they burn real money to give them? But they burn this fake money, and you can buy everything. You can buy a, a paper house. Um, you can buy paper clothes. You can buy a car like a Maserati, a paper car, and burn them. And then they think it goes into the next world where the ancestors are. But I'm thinking, why buy a paper car? Why not a real car? If, <laughs> won't they feel cheated to just get a little paper thing? But, but anyway, I'm trying to think through this, and I'm thinking, how will burning it get it to them, you know? But th that's part of the belief. It's very deep-rooted belief in the traditional Chinese world. And you might even see it around you in your neighbors. You might even see their little incense thing by the door or something. They burn incense to worship to them. And so um, they're doing this. But my wife noticed very carefully, this time, this year we went, before my father-in-law was baptized, that this time he didn't do the worshiping act. He didn't do the worship. So maybe he was already, God was working faith in his heart. You know. So um, um, this is another part of my work. We'll depart from that for a minute. Um, an article about Luther and his um, learning about the Bible. And 500 years ago when he started discovering the real gospel and how the whole church had gone <laughs> away from the gospel. So I had to prepare a big lecture for um, our big seminar that we had on um, sola scriptura. Sola scriptura means the Bible alone. The Bible alone is our authority, not any man or any um, system or anything else. The Bible alone is our authority when it comes to knowing about God. And so that took a lot of work. And here, here we are at their seminar that our seminary put on, um, this part of my work to, besides teaching classes, I go around and do s seminars or lectures or teaching in other places. Well, we had over 200 people here. That's me there answering a question and a German professor and then two, our two Chinese presidents, the former president and the current president. And so um, the current president is actually a Missouri Senate pastor. He just come back from being in the United States for 17 years. But um, um, this is another thing. This picture is a little bit dark, but what my wife and another pastor's wife, and this is a pastor and a staff member from our seminary, they're holding up a pig's foot there. And this restaurant is actually kind of a famous restaurant in the south part of Taiwan for eating pig's feet. Pig's feet is being, um, German pig's feet. I don't know if you ever ate that, but um, pig's feet, yeah, <laughs> or pork knuckles. Some of them call it pork knuckles. Sounds better than pig's feet, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it's one of my favorites. It's actually one of my favorites. And, um, <laughs> so um, that's the famous restaurant there. We went down to give a lecture at, in a church on Martin Luther's in his Reformation. And, um, Here's the church, and this is a video too. Can you press the press that one? I'm just uh oh. So, well, let's watch it somehow. You have to cock your head a little bit. <laughs> I don't know why it went that way, but you see, I'm walking up. It's a kind of a traditional Chinese neighborhood, brick houses. But as you go up in, tucked into it, is a Lutheran church there. You see the cross there, and then very much like the Lutheran. Yeah, it's almost exactly the same as that. Luther heart, right? Right up on that church, right? This little traditional Chinese neighborhood, kind of interesting. So I gave a um, lecture there. And this is another part of my work that's really a blessing. Um, one of my students became a missionary to a really tough country. He and his wife and children, they're going to Pakistan, which is the seventh of the persecuting Christian countries. From one to the first, they rate them. Who persecutes Christians the most? Who is the second most? Pakistan is the seventh leading country for persecuting Christians. And they have them rated all the way down to the 50th. The first, the first this year was North Korea. North Korea is the great, the large, or the most persecuting of Christians country in the whole world now. 
in last year. This was last year. And so um, then Pakistan was the seventh. So I didn't even put the name of the country there because they're very sensitive. And in any of their prayer letters, they don't put, you know, names of things um, just to pray for them. And because they're, it's a Muslim country and they're going to spread the gospel among um, Muslims. And, oh, I lost some else. But um, he invited me to preach, to be the preacher for his commissioning service. And, and so um, they're preaching for the service. And then here we are. Here's a man and his wife that we're praying. All of his pastors and his mission group um, are praying for him to send him to Pakistan. And so this is one thing I see, a trend in many Chinese are having the boldness to go into the Muslim world to spread the gospel. And um, there's still a lot of Americans there, but it's very tough for them. We're very identifiable. But you know, the Chinese, they don't have the historical background we have with the Crusades and the terrorism. Um, and the Chinese live right there within the, the Muslim world, you know, in China and South Asia and um, everywhere. So. So they are really having this heart and burden to go and spread the gospel among the Muslim world. They can do it more easily than we are, we do, and more less obviously, you know, than than we could be. So, uh, the language uh, uh, is, is all this uh, taught in the, in the Chinese uh, culture. Yeah. The village you teach in uh, yeah in Mandarin language. Yeah, yeah I, I teach it all in Mandarin language. Okay, then the, my other curiosity is that. Uh, how long did it take you to, to assimilate to um, It took me three years just to get to a point where I could have simple conversations. Were, were you under uh, instructional type things or were you good at a mechanical thing? When, um, when, when you learned to speak? Well, when I learned to speak, I was in St. Louis at the seminary. And I took, for this? I took a class, yeah. I was preparing. Okay. So I studied there for four years, Chinese. I went to a Chinese church in a Chinese fellowship, and I took a class at a nearby university in Chinese language. And then I learned a lot on my own. I studied a lot on my own. So um, I, it took me longer than I expected. I wanted in one year to be able to have conversation. I think with French and Spanish and German, we could do that, you know. But Chinese is much harder. But then even after that, even four years, I when I started teaching in Taiwan, I would... I still had a translator to help me in class, but actually not much. So I made the students suffer through my Chinese a lot in the early years. And um, I, I've got kind of fluent, but actually my wife can tell you, even after 20 years, I've learned Chinese 20 years, even after 20 years, I say a lot of things wrong. And my, Chinese, my wife is my best teacher, and she's the most honest with me about you know, <laughs> my pronunciation. So what about communication as far as written communication? Um, yeah, I, I can write... Chinese and type, type it. Okay. Yeah, so I have to prepare, like lectures, like that lecture I mentioned, I prepared a whole article, but I have to spend a lot more time doing that. And I do have another Chinese teacher I meet with every week, and this Chinese teacher helps me to correct, you know, what I've written. So, and I learn a lot by her helping to correct me. So, but what our tendency is, is to um, put our own language grammar into the new language. And um, Jerry, you, you were listening to Ginny talk back there, and she would say, this is what? This is what? Is that how we say it in English? We usually say, what is this, right? We usually put the question word first, but in Chinese, they put it last. So she'll say, this is what? Who, that is who? And of course, we understand it, but we don't normally speak that way. That's because she's putting Chinese grammar into it. And so I speak Chinese that way. I put English grammar and word usage in my language. So I have to continually correct it and learn. So every week I still have Chinese class, even after 20 years. I, so, my, But my work is more intense with Chinese because I have to read the master's degree students' papers. I have to read their papers and their tests. And I have to prepare tests. I have to prepare my class notes and lectures and stuff. So I'm not only writing, but... You know, not only listening and talking, but writing, too. So your whole lifestyle yeah. is not in that kind of Sure, sure. And I always talk to my wife in Chinese and kids. But I found out I have to teach, 
talk to my kids in English a lot so that they'll be able to talk in English when they come back here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, it's all preaching. And this is at our, our <laughs> seminary, a mission fair. So our seminary is very involved in mission work, too, trying to encourage that. And we want to really encourage the Chinese to take up that baton of mission work and really press through to the ends of the earth, through the Muslim world. And, um, this is teaching in class. So sometimes we have, like, here maybe about seven or eight students, sometimes maybe 25 or 30 students in the class. And here is another part of the work that I'm involved in. This is a committee for translating um, Luther's works into Chinese. And so far we have three volumes. And you know the St. Louis edition of Luther's works has 55 volumes. It's been translated into English. So um, in the Chinese world it's still very slow. We have three volumes plus another two that our seminary has done that will probably get adopted by this and another one that's about to come out. So by the end of this year, we might have seven, seven volumes of Luther's works translated into Chinese. And, um, okay, this is a mission group, actually from Holy Cross in Los Gatos. And I'll be there next week, and they also, like Calvary, support me, and they send a mission group of seven people to our seminary and to some churches in Taiwan. And they brought some gifts for the children that they really like. Um, they did it an interesting way. They had their Sunday school give offerings for the missionary children gifts, and then they had the Sunday school children pick the gifts for that age group. And that's good because they know what <laughs> children of those age groups like, you know, what boys like, girls like. And so they brought some little gifts, a bag of gifts, and then they really like them. And here's the mission team. They had some music and then some... Um, the leader of the team is actually 80 years old. And he's still a vibrant guy and um, his wife. And um, so they had different age groups. And this woman is like the administrator and secretary of the church, DCE. And here's the leader of the group, Gene Ecker. And he's with Maggie in our home. They came to our home and just prayed with us, encouraged us. They did some other things around the seminary too. They um, led the devotions for our staff. And they did a service project painting. Painting a room that needed painting there. 